Hello there, random smart person on the internet. No matter where you look in the universe, in any direction, your line of sight will eventually run into some type of matter or radiation. The Earth is embedded in our solar system with planets, moons, rocky and icy bodies, dust, and plasma particles permeating our environment. Beyond our own backyard are stars, gas, and dust strewn throughout the Milky Way. And at even greater cosmic distances are galaxies, quasars, and the matter in the intergalactic medium. If you somehow manage to pick a line of sight that doesn't run into any of those, you'll still encounter something, the cosmic microwave background radiation, which was left over from the Big Bang. And yet, no matter where we look in any direction, two properties will correspond to whatever objects we see. First, we are seeing objects not as they are today, but as they were a finite amount of time ago, when it emitted its light that is now striking our eyes. I covered this topic in the second video I ever made. The second is that an object is currently a specific distance away from us. If we could somehow freeze time and measure the distance between ourselves and that object, we would get a certain value. You might think that these two properties, time and distance, would be equal. A star whose light arrives after a journey of 10 years is 10 light years away. A galaxy whose light arrives after a 100 million year journey is 100 million light years away. Light from the Big Bang that arrives after a 13.8 billion year journey has the emission location of 13.8 billion light years away. But that's not true at all, and the expanding universe is to blame. One of the laws of physics that get drilled into us is that there's a speed limit to the universe called the speed of light, and absolutely nothing can travel through space faster than that. If you're a completely massless entity, like a photon or a gluon, you absolutely must move at the speed of light, and there is no other speed possible. If you're a positive, non-zero mass, however, you can only approach, but never reach, the speed of light. You must always travel slower than it. Therefore, if something emits light at any point, that light can only travel directly away from the source that it emitted it. After one second, that light would be 299,792 kilometers away from that source. One light second. Or 186,282 miles away if we're using freedom units. After one year, the light would be 9.46 trillion kilometers away from the source. One light year. After one billion years, the light would be one billion light years away from that location where it was emitted. This type of calculation is sensible, straightforward, and intuitive. Under the laws of special relativity, it is absolutely correct. However, our universe is not governed just by special relativity, but by something more. This analysis only applies if space has two specific properties that we know it does not actually possess. For starters, space would need to be 100% flat everywhere with no exceptions, like a three-dimensional Euclidean grid. Flatness can be defined for any general space, and the way you can tell whether your space is flat or not is by picking three points and connecting them by drawing three lines to make a triangle. You can then add up the three interior angles of the triangle that you just drew and compare the results and see what you get. On a flat piece of paper, you would get 180 degrees. However, not all pieces of paper are flat where the angles add up to 180 degrees, and not every instance of space is either. If you drew a triangle on a globe, you will find that the interior angles always sum up to more than 180 degrees with larger triangles resulting in greater departures from 180 degrees. Similarly, if you drew a triangle on a horse saddle, you would find the interior angles always summed up to be less than 180 degrees. The universe is not like a piece of paper. Because of the presence of mass and energy, the fabric of space gets curved depending on how matter and energy, especially the mass portion, is distributed. With all that said, astronomers do say that the universe is flat because it is mostly flat. It is just not 100% flat in all locations. And no, we're not talking about the flatness like a flat Earth. Newsflash, the Earth is not flat. We're just talking about the geometry of space with respect to angles. But even more importantly than being curved, the fabric of space is not static. This is more than just the intuitive masses move around and mass determines how space is curved, therefore the spatial curvature changes. That statement is true, but there is something much more profound happening. Under the laws of Einstein's general theory of relativity, which is our theory of gravity, a universe is filled with matter and energy that cannot be static and stable. If you start a universe in a static state and simply allow it to gravitate over time, it would not remain static. Instead, it would collapse, and in short order, your entire universe would come to an end, forming an inevitable black hole. Now, this clearly hasn't happened in our universe, and there's an excellent reason why. If you uniformly fill the universe with both matter and energy, it must either expand or contract, 
The distance between two any well separated points will change over time. We have no way of knowing which one would wind up describing the universe the same way you cannot know whether the square root of four is positive two or negative two. Both expansion and contraction are mathematically allowable solutions for our universe, but we have to measure the universe itself to find out which one is occurring. Key observations for solving this problem were made all the way back in the 1910s and 1920s. In fact, it was a combination of three sets of observations that led to a solution to this puzzle. First was Henrietta Leavitt's work on sepiate variable stars, which related to the time period it takes for a star to go from its maximum brightness to its minimum brightness, and then back to the intrinsic brightness of the star itself. The second was Vesto Slipher's work on redshift, in which he measured a significant number of spiral galaxies and elliptical galaxies in the sky and determined, from the shift of their emission and absorption lines, how quickly they appear to be moving towards or away from us. And finally, Edwin Hubble's work on which individual Cepheid variable stars were measured in those spiral and elliptical galaxies. With those combined properties, we can determine both the distance to a spiral or elliptical galaxy, as well as infer the motion of those galaxies. When the data was put together, both initially and in modern times, the result was unambiguous. The further an object is, the more its light is redshifted and the faster it appears to be receding from us. In other words, the universe must be expanding. This has major implications for the idea of a static universe. If the universe were static, then the amount of time it took for light to travel a certain distance from the emitting source to the observer that absorbed it would be exactly equal to the conversion from the years to light years. Because light must travel at the speed of light, the light arriving at our eyes today from an object one light year away would take one year for its journey to us. An object 1 million light years away would take 1 million years to journey to us, and an object 10 billion light years away would take 10 billion years to journey to us. That means if our universe is 13.8 billion years old, which is the amount of time that has elapsed since the Big Bang, then the most distant light that could be possible that we are seeing arrive to us after a journey of 13.8 billion years. And hence, that light must have traveled 13.8 billion light years. This is consistent with the space-time tool known as a light cone, where everything inside the cone is connected to us, meaning a signal from it could affect us, or a signal from us could affect it, but everything outside the cone is disconnected, meaning no signals can ever be exchanged. But the scenario we live in, an expanding universe, changes everything. Instead of viewing space like a grid with objects strewn about it, we should be viewing it as a ball of leavening dough with raisins embedded in it. As time passes, the fabric of space expands, just like the ball of dough rising. In fact, if you imagine yourself as any one of the raisins, you'll notice that the nearby raisins appear to be expanding slowly away from you because there's only a small amount of leavening dough between your raisin and the nearby raisins. However, the more distance there is between your raisin and another, the more dough there is between you as well, which translates into more leavening and the greater increase in your relative distance over the same amount of time. Each raisin represents a gravitationally bound object in our universe, just like our local group of galaxies. The Virgo cluster is a raisin. The Leo group is a raisin. The Coma cluster is a raisin, and so on. Because they are bound by gravity, they themselves don't expand. But each individual structure that is not bound to another expands away from every other structure, just like raisins in the rising ball of dough. This means that within our own galaxy or our own local group, the expansion of the universe is completely negligible. It is only on large cosmic scales where we observe objects that might be bound to one another in a larger structure, but not bound to the same structure we are a part of. When we are talking about cosmic distances and other objects within our local group, an object's distance from us in light years and the number of years it took for that light to travel to us are equivalent. Astronomers call this look back time. Dividing the object's look back time by the speed of light will give us a look back time of approximately 99.9% .9 precision, so long as the expansion of the universe is negligible. But on larger cosmic scales, something far more intricate is going on. When light comes to us from more distant objects, like a galaxy or a quasar outside of our local group, the following process occurs. Light is emitted from a distant object at the speed of light. As the light travels towards its destination through the intergalactic space, the distance between its emitting object and the object that will eventually absorb it continues to increase. While the light is in its journey, the expansion of the universe stretches its wavelength of light, causing it to lengthen, which we observe as redshift. Simultaneously, the distance between the emitting object and the eventual observer continues to increase. 
As a result, when the light finally arrives, the original distance between the emitter and the absorber was much smaller than the distance it is now. Meanwhile, if you were to multiply the look back time by the speed of light, you would get an in-between distance, larger for the original distance, but smaller than the distance it is today. That's where the discrepancy between the age of the universe and the farthest objects we're able to see comes from. This difference between look back time and the present distance between ourselves and that distant object is only important on large cosmic scales. The most prominent galaxies in our own night sky, including Andromeda, the Pinwheel Galaxy, Bode's Galaxy, and the Sombrero Galaxy, appear as they were about the same amount of millions of years as the distance it is of light years away from us. A galaxy whose light arrives after 100 million year journey is now 101 million light years away. Only a minuscule difference. But with very large distances, the expanding universe plays an even bigger role. Light arriving from an object that began its journey 1 billion years ago corresponds to an object that is currently 1.036 billion light years away. Light arriving from an object that began its journey 5 billion years ago corresponds to an object presently 6.087 billion light years away. Light arriving from an object that began its journey 10 billion years ago corresponds to an object presently 16.03 billion light years away. And light arriving from an object that began its journey 13.77 billion years ago corresponds to an object presently 41.6 billion light years away. It is not that we are seeing farther back in space than we are time. Instead, it is that space and time are related. The universe is expanding, and the effects of that expansion are cumulative. They affect the light traveling through the universe during every step of its journey. The light that travels the longest gets stretched by the greatest amount, and the object that is emitted that light is now at a greater distance because the universe is expanding. We can see objects up to 46.1 billion light years away precisely because of the expanding universe. No matter how much time has passed, there will be forever limits on the objects that we can observe and the objects we can potentially reach. As long as space and time are linked by the laws of Einstein's relativity, there are limits that can never be circumvented. When you look up at the night sky, remember these three things. When we look back at objects in space, we're not seeing them as they are now, but as they were a long time ago. For nearby objects, our distance from them in light years is equal to the look back time in years. But for extremely distant objects, we can see back more than three times as far in terms of light years than we can in terms of years because of our expanding universe. So there you have it. You learned how we could see objects 46 billion light years away in a universe that's only 13.8 billion years old. Leave a comment down below on which object in the cosmos is your favorite to look at. Comments are good for the YouTube algorithm. If you know a teacher or a teacher yourself and want to partner your class with Fun With STEM, click on the video right here. Or if you would like to learn more about our outer solar system, click on the video right here. And always remember, have fun with STEM.